So would you like to start by introducing yourself? Uh, in a military context or in a civilian context? Uh, military. Okay. Um, so uh, my name's James Swanston. Uh, I uh, am a TA officer and I command um, the City of London Fusilier Company of the London Regiment. Mm-hmm. And when did you join the army and where were you living at the time? Ah, well, I actually joined the Australian Army um, a million years ago on the 12th of May 1995, so it's far too long ago. But anyway, um, and that was in Brisbane, Australia, and I was in the Aussie Army uh, until 2005, and then got out and moved here to sunny London uh, in 2007, um, and I joined the British Army sort of at the end of that year. What made you want to join the Army? Um, I, it was a bit of fun, um, but also, you know, I think, you know, there is a, a degree of duty associated with being in the army, sort of, uh, it, you know, it wasn't, you know, my, my parents' first choice of, of career for me, so, um, I think, you know, I was very keen on, you know, doing, you know, the whole Queen and Country bit as well, so I think that's a big part of it. After joining the army, when and where did your training take place? Um, some people would argue I've never been trained, but um, I, I did most of my training uh, in Australia, um, in Canberra, which is sort of the capital, um, and so I went through officer training uh, down there, uh, and then various other exciting parts of, of Australia as well. Um, what was the selection procedure for you to enter into training? <laughs> Clearly flawed, <laughs> is the answer. So um, you sort of have to do... Uh, you know, basic things to get into the military, sort of, you know, your medical, some basic physical tests, um, and also sort of some uh, tests to see, you know, whether you were remotely intelligent or not. Um, and then for officer selection specifically, you had to sort of do a range of uh, challenges and command tasks to see how you were like with a group and whether you had any leadership qualities and stuff like that. Um, what was a typical day of training like for you? Uh, hellish. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, it would. Uh, I guess you know, start very early um, uh, with uh, some physical training, uh, breakfast, um, room inspections. So you always have to keep your room clean, um, and then yeah, you know, really depended on what you were doing. Sort of barracks lessons um, were you know always in lecture theatres, a bit like university, but just in uniform. And you had to behave and not fall asleep, um, or you know, go out into the field and you know, for a week or two at a time and uh, learn basic tactics and things like that. So it's a real varied sort of mix of things. What was the hardest bit for you about the training? Uh, keeping my room clean. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I, I went through when I was eighteen as a as an office cadet. So um, you know, it's always tough. You know, at that age, trying to display leadership skills and qualities and perhaps be mature enough to demonstrate that you can be you know, capable of you know, commanding you know, a team, as it were. Um, since your initial training, have you done any further training? Yes, I've done lots of courses. So uh, as an infantry officer, sort of, I did um, the infantry training for officers um, and I did uh, recce, so reconnaissance um, qualification, uh, and then I switched over to intelligence. So uh, I was trained in a number of sort of intelligence collection activities as well. When did you switch over to intelligence? Uh, at the end of 1999. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, have you been involved with training other soldiers? Yes, um, quite a bit actually. So. Um, I guess at the moment, if I look at my, my soldiers at the moment, we have half of them are trained soldiers and half aren't. So I sort of, I, I don't necessarily do all the actual training now, but certainly in terms of um, overseeing how the training goes, what the process is and everything like that. So, I mean, you're always training you know, when you're not on operations. So it's, it's a key bit of, of being an officer, I guess. Do you think the training's different now that you're overseeing to how it was when you were younger? Um, I think... Uh, the the big difference now is there's probably a lot more focus on you know certain current operations. So in the mid nineties, um, you know, in Australia, lots you know we had Vietnam veterans who were my sort of instructors. Um, you know, so they'd been to war in the nineteen sixties and nineteen seventies, which is quite a long time ago. I even had one instructor who was in the Korea War, so that's you know quite a while ago. Whereas um, now, I mean, I think a lot is around the current, you know, tempo of operations in Afghanistan and stuff like that, so, yeah. I understand that as well as undertaking training, you've got several degrees. 
um, yes. in things like modern age and studies. Yes. How have you been able to apply these degrees to your life in the army? Um, so I, I grew up in Asia. Um, so I, I learnt Malay there, and then one of my degrees I have an Indonesian major in. So when I was on my uh, recce course in Australia, I ended up having to look after two Indonesian officers. Um, and then when I was in East Timor, I uh, did some um, interpreting work. Um, but, and funnily enough, I ran into the same Indonesian officers <laughs> on the border, so that was always quite funny, yeah. sort of seeing them you know, in a training environment and then seeing them on the, you know, the other side of, <laughs> of the fence, as it were, in, a, in an operational context. Um, so you served in the Australian Army, and one aspect I particularly want to look at yeah. is your time in Iraq. Yes. When you served, worked on intelligence. Yes. Um, what exactly um, was this, and how long did you serve there for? So I, I, um, I actually spent quite a bit of time working on Iraq. So in 2003, when the uh, war started, I was uh, involved in um, an intelligence collection agency supporting guys who were on the ground in western Iraq. So there are a lot of Australian and British special forces there, so we were doing a lot of the intelligence support to that. Uh, and then when I went, I was seconded to the US military, um, and I worked in their plans organisation, so helping uh, the commanding general come up with his cunning plans for doing everything um, in the Iraq theatre of war. Um, what preparation did you do before arriving to confront your new role? Um, interesting. I mean, a lot of my studies probably helped quite a bit, and also growing up in a Muslim country was very useful, particularly when I was dealing with um, a lot of... Um, Iraqis um, and then I one of my master's theses was on Islamic extremism um, so I actually had a, a, a very good understanding uh, of the area anyway and because you know, through 2002 and 2003 and particularly 2003 I'd spent a lot of time looking at Iraq um, I'd sort of I was used to that operational theatre anyway so yeah um, so part of your role would have had would have been to interact with governments. Um, how did you manage this yeah, on that operation? Yeah. So that was that was a really interesting time because uh, in Iraq, then you had the coalition provisional authority, um, which was sort of a US-backed organisation, and the we were still very much trying to set up a local government um, in, in Iraq. So uh, one of the interesting things was I'd often go along to the the fledgling National Security Council, which is being set up uh, in Iraq. Um, but um, aside from that, you know, there was a new Ministry of Defence ha happening there, and then a lot of things were really around the various the, the various factions that uh, existed, whether they were Sunni or Shia. So that was uh, that was always a, an interesting thing to do. In what ways did you try and help the Security Council um, become more established? It, well, we were literally at the very, you know, very start of it, so it was actually about physically creating it uh, and everything like that, and helping to put in process um, or put in place processes for how they operate, how they share information with with the coalition, and vice versa. So, as as you look at partnering in a in a war zone, you need to help build up the local security forces and that implies trust not only around training and operations but also what information you have to share with them so, so that was sort of something that I had to had to look at which was it's a very interesting problem to actually have to try and deal mm -hmm. with. Um, how is intelligence used in decision making overall and do you think it's important in making decisions about strategy? Um, well, I guess there's probably a difference between how it should be used and how it is used sometimes. So, um, yeah, the, it, you know, it, it's always important to have a, an insight into where you're going and, and what's going on. And I think sometimes a lot of um, problems in military campaigns have arisen out of not really understanding where you're going into or the, or the, uh, the local conditions. And, you know, looking at what happened in Iraq in 2003 is a perfect example of that where... You know, anyone who understood the problems and issues there would never have sacked the Iraqi army. Um, you know, that was an utterly stupid decision. Um, and it just demonstrated a, a degree of ignorance about what should happen. Um, but that's not to say that a lot of people um, perhaps didn't pass up that guidance. So, um, you know, intelligence is just one part of, of the picture. Sometimes um, 
you know, there are other competing interests at play as well. So it, it's important to always take account of the intelligence um, and information you have about what's happening, but sometimes it's, it's not the overriding factor for what you do. Um, do you think the public perception of intelligence in Iraq was accurate? Um, so I think the interesting issue there is that it's there's always sometimes a difference between the intelligence information that's collected, uh, then how it's analysed, and then how it's portrayed by government. Uh, and sometimes governments are able to not necessarily demonstrate the actual source of the material they use when they say things. Um, and you know, you saw that with uh, when Colin Powell went to the UN Security Council. Um, talking about those various trucks and milk floats or whatever they were. and you know, the, the, the tragedy is that if you're able to dig into where that uh, information came from, you would realise that it's not a very credible source. So um, I think um, the intelligence community probably got a bit um, maligned a bit unfairly because um, there was a degree of um, inaccurate reporting on, on the validity of the information that was gleaned in a few places. What was the most challenging part of your role in intelligence? Uh, there are in, in Iraq or just generally? In Iraq, yeah. Um, um, I guess, you know, that, uh, it probably comes back to this interesting conflict of what you want to do on the ground versus what the political situation is, whether it's in Iraq or indeed in the United States or the international community. Because the, the military force is not just there about doing something at a local level actually it's a projection of political power from a, a big country and sometimes there's a massive misalignment between what those two things are so sometimes the political goals um, at an international level are very very different from what the goals should be on the ground so I think that was an interesting predicament to have to try and deal with. Um, what was your interaction with the local population like in Iraq? Um, it was alright I mean it was it was it was um, not as much as what I'd had in, say, East Timor, where it was a very benign environment and you could chat to everyone. Um, but we had, uh, you know, some very interesting discussions and, and relationships with with both Sunni and Shia people. More Shia, which is a bit of a shame, but because um, I think, you know, a lot of the Sunni population was massively disenfranchised in 2003. Um, but there was... Yeah, there were some really good positive signs of of progress. I mean, Iraq is an awesome country. You know, it's uh, it's got a tremendous history. Um, it'll be fantastic as a tourist destination, um, and they've also got a fantastic education system and great light manufacturing. So, you know, all all the bits of a, a functioning you know society are there. It's just a shame that there's a real tension between you know the three big, um, I guess, ethnic groups there. Did you think there was extremes of wealth? in Iraq, was it mainly a very poor community where you were? Uh, no, I mean, I think, uh, I, I mean, I was based in Baghdad, but we travelled around a lot. Um, I think there probably were some extremes of wealth, although I didn't really see that. Um, very different from Afghanistan, where everyone just seems to be extremely poor. <laughs> so, so it's a very, very different dynamic. Um, how did civilians fight against the regime, if they did so? Uh, so, I think... Uh, that there, there was a real need to separate uh, the sort of true believers in jihad or, or or whatever from those who supported the old regime because the old you know, the Saddam Hussein regime was not religious by any stretch of the imagination. Um, uh, they were very much a political you know entity, uh, and then at the other end of the scale, you had people who um, had no money and they were getting paid cash to shoot at us and it was actually just part of how they survived on a day-to-day -day basis so um, you know was, I think there's a real you know difference between those groups and it was very important to sort of try and make that distinction because if you could you know the biggest group were those who were just trying to you know earn a living and you know the, the great thing sort of you know laughing the campaign there was that people realize that and you would start to pay the locals and essentially you you price the enemy out of out of the equation by giving them work and, and everything like that um how aware were you of the coverage of the iraq war in australian newspapers um it got a lot of bad coverage <laughs> um and i mean again a lot of this plays to the fact that it's a it's 
very much a political war as much as a, an actual war. Um, you know, the, the Iraq campaign was not a popular uh, thing with uh, the Australian people, um, although, you know, from uh, an Australian foreign policy perspective, there were some huge benefits uh, in terms of the relationship with the United States and, and so on. Um, so, yeah, there was a tremendous amount of uh, negative coverage uh, in Australia, and certainly, you know, family and friends weren't overly supportive of, uh, of me being there, so, yeah. Um, what was your most memorable moment of being in Iraq? I don't know if there is one. Um, I, I don't know. I actually just really enjoyed my time there. So, um, yeah, it was awesome to be able to be a, in a headquarters, um, sort of working almost directly for the guy in charge in Iraq uh, and sort of being involved in this huge military operation with, you know, a couple of hundred thousand people. You know, it's, it's something you don't get to do every day and, you know, and, you know even Afghanistan isn't quite that sizable. So it's just great to be at the centre of things and, and see these big events sort of taking shape around you. What was your day-to-day -day life like out there? What were the conditions like in which you lived? Uh, so we lived in one of Saddam's former palaces. So, it, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. Um, the, the building looked very nice from the outside. Some of the, the construction was a bit dodgy. Um, and uh, we had... I worked sort of in this great little cell with, you know, 20 or 30 really, really smart people, um, you know, a lot of whom had doctorates and stuff like that, um, working on the planning for, for everything in Iraq. So, you know, day would start, um, you know, between 8 and 10, depending on how late you worked the night before, and then finish at about midnight to 2 a.m. or something like that. So, you know, really heavy days, um, and we'd travel around a lot. So I would typically go around with sort of one of the generals to various outlying bits of Iraq, you know, for a day trip <laughs> in a black hole helicopter. So that was always interesting. Did you travel in your free time in Iraq? Uh, no. No. <laughs> no, there was no free time and yeah, it, it wasn't really a place where you could travel around, unfortunately. So. What was your work like, though, like each week? Uh, significant. So um, it was, you know, so, um, there were sort of two big strengths to what I did. One was providing sort of a set of um, strategic assessment for the commanding generals in Iraq, uh, and that was what I would do every night with a couple of other officers. Uh, and then during the day, we were planning all of the main operations, mm -hmm. and some of that, you know, included travelling around. So, I mean, I, I spent quite a lot of time wandering around the ruins of ancient Babylon, which is really awesome. So, yeah. Um, when did you eventually leave, and why? Uh, so my uh, tour ended in August, uh, so at the end of about seven months in being there. So I, I would have loved to stay, but unfortunately, the Australian military did, you know, six, seven months tours in. So, yeah. Did you find it easy to adapt to life back in Australia after being in Iraq? Uh, it was it was a bit of a challenge, um, sort of, uh, and it, I, I think sometimes every time you come home from an operation, it's it's always a very different thing to to come back to, um, and you know I definitely would have liked to stay there and you know get you know get a few things finished that uh, I hadn't done, but um, yeah I, I think it's always a bit of a challenge going home. So yeah. What do you miss most when you get, when you get home? Um, I think I think in any profession you do a lot of training, um, and it's always far more fulfilling when you're actually doing the job you're trained to do. Um, I mean, I guess a doctor goes through five years of medical school or whatever, and then they can actually do their profession every day. Whereas for us, it's years of training, and then you go away for a few months at a time. And so, so I think it's always the reality that you've got to go back into a training cycle, which is always boring because you think you've done it all before and, and everything like that. So, You won several awards in your time in Iraq. Can you explain what they are and what you did for them? Uh, well, I, I got two. Um, I was awarded the United States Bronze Star um, for extraordinary meritorious achievements. So it's probably a bit like an MBE or something like that. So um, the, the Bronze Star can be awarded for valour, um, in which case it's like a military cross, um, or or sort of for, for people like me, sort of who do things that are seen as good kind of thing. So. Um, and then I was awarded a Australian Joint Operations Command accommodation uh, as well for being a good boy, I guess. So, 
Yeah. 